everybody. Welcome back to Reading During Recess, where today we are going to be talking about The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. I am Terry, and I'm a first grade teacher. And I'm Sarah, and I'm a writer. And today we have a very special guest with us. Please welcome Sonia Lara. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Yes, thank you so much for coming on the show, Sonia. I know that this is one of your favorite books, and so I really wanted to get a chance to talk to you about it. So Sonia and I know each other because we're both writers and we went to the same MFA program at Virginia Tech. We met there. She's a wonderful poet and nonfiction essayist. And you also write some fiction too, right? Yeah, you know, I try. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. So Sonia is a biracial Mexican-American writer from Chicago, Illinois. And I particularly wanted to talk to Sonia about this episode because The House on Mango Street is famously set in Chicago in a Mexican-American neighborhood. And so Sonia received her BA in creative writing from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is currently pursuing her MFA in poetry at Virginia Tech. Currently, she is the poetry editor for Minerva Rising and an editor-at-large for Cleaver Magazine. And previously, she was the managing editor for The New River and the managing editor of the Minnesota Review and an associate fiction editor of the Madison Review. So lots of editing. Yowza. What don't you do? (laughs) I try to stay busy. Her work has appeared or is forthcoming in Entropy, Homology Lit, Ogni. She has a great essay out in the newest issue of Ogni that you guys should read. The Los Angeles Review, The Ascentos Review, and elsewhere. And for more information, you can visit sonialara.com. That's S-O-N-Y-A-L-A-R-A.com. So today, like I said, we're going to be talking about The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. And this is a pretty famous book. It's considered a contemporary classic of young adult literature and Chicano literature. It was published in 1984, and it's structured as a series of vignettes. And it follows 12-year-old Esperanza Cordero, a Chicana girl living in the Hispanic quarter of Chicago. And so Cisneros has described the book as a necklace of stories because it doesn't really have a super linear plot or narrative structure. It's really, like I said, a series of vignettes that read almost like prose poems about Esperanza's life and her family and friends in this neighborhood. I love that description. And it is so Cisneros. If you read the book and you hear her language, as soon as I saw that she described it as a necklace of stories, I was like, well, of course it is. Because it's so beautiful, you know? I mean, it's and delicate hmm. and precise. It's really... And it all comes, to, you know, it's it's separate pieces that come together in this really lovely way. Yeah. yeah. To me, it kind of feels like a family heirloom after you read the book once. Like, if we're going to talk about this, like, necklace theme, like, once you read it, to me, I feel like it's something that you want to hold on to for a really long time that, like, you want to pass down to other people. I love uh, that. Yeah, that's a beautiful metaphor. I love that. So this book is considered a modern classic of Chicano literature and has actually sold more than 6 million copies and been translated into more than 20 languages. And it's also required reading in a lot of schools and universities. It was very well received when it was published. I'm going to read you guys a quote from B.B. Moore Campbell from the New York Times Book Review, who said, Cisneros draws on her rich Latino heritage and seduces with precise, spare prose, creating unforgettable characters we want to lift off the page. She is not only a gifted writer, but an absolutely essential one. So this book, as I said, was extremely well received, but it has also been banned in some school curriculums due to its sensitive subject matter. And we'll talk more about that as we get into it. Yes. I did want to give a content warning at the beginning of this episode, just to let our listeners know that today we'll be discussing the book, and this book discusses domestic and sexual abuse. So Sandra Cisneros is a Mexican-American author born in 1954. She is best known for her first novel, The House on Mango Street, and her subsequent short story collection, Woman Hollering Creek and Other Stories. And if you love The House on Mango Street, then I highly recommend the other short story collection. I also cannot put that one down. She has received a NEA fellowship and is regarded as a key figure in Chicana literature. Her work has some biographical elements. She was born in Chicago, was the only daughter in a large Mexican-American family, and often felt as if she was always straddling two countries but not belonging to either culture. 
As a child, her family was constantly moving between the U.S. and Mexico. These frequent moves meant that Cisneros had to become comfortable being alone, a fact that probably shaped her eventual love of writing. She received a B.A. from Loyola University, Chicago in 1976 and an M.F.A. from the Iowa Writers' Workshop in 1978. In addition to her writing, Cisneros has fostered the careers of many aspiring and emerging writers through two nonprofits she founded, the Macondo Foundation and the Alfredo Cisneros del Moro Foundation. She is also the organizer of Los Mac Arturos, Latino MacArthur Fellows who are community activists. And she says that we do this because the world we live in is a house on fire and the people we love are burning. She currently lives in Mexico. I love that quote. Me too. Whew. Okay, I think it is best to start off with giving you all a little plot summary of the book. Like I said, the book doesn't really have a super traditional linear plot, but there's definitely some important plot points that it's necessary, I think, to know about in order to really appreciate a conversation about the book. Yes, so The House on Mango Street is a coming-of-age story, and it's narrated by a 12-year-old Chicana girl named Esperanza Cordero. And the book, as Sarah said, is written in vignettes, and it covers one year of her life. And it starts with the family's move to uh, the house, which is in the title, which is in a Latino neighborhood in Chicago. And her family, which is Esperanza, her parents, and her three siblings, have made lots of moves in the past and have always dreamed of and talked about living in a house of their own. While the house on Mango Street is truly theirs, they do own it, it's not what any of them dreamed of. It's a small, crumbling red brick house that is not like the big white wooden one that Esperanza's parents talked about owning someday. It's not like the houses that Esperanza sees on TV sitcoms. But despite her disappointment, Esperanza and her little sister Nenny begin exploring the neighborhood and meeting other members of the community. And first, Esperanza meets Kathy a white girl who tells her that she can only be Esperanza's friend until Tuesday because her family is about to move because they say that the neighborhood is getting worse. And then Esperanza... Jesus Christ, Kathy. Yeah, Kathy's rude. Really Read the room. (laughs) Um, So that's racist Kathy. (laughs) Luckily, she doesn't stay around for very long. And then Esperanza and Nanny befriend two girls named Rachel and Lucy, who are sisters and who are nicer. And they, all three of them, chip in money to buy a secondhand bike to share between them. The four girls quickly become close, and through Esperanza's narration, we see the lives of the men, women, and children who live in the neighborhood. There's a particular focus on the women and girls, many of whom seem trapped in some way or another. We meet Marin, a Puerto Rican girl who gets a lot of attention from men, Rosa, whose husband left her and their unruly children, Alicia, an exhausted university student whose father expects her to handle housework as well. Rafaela, ugh, one of my favorite stories and characters, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. whose husband locks her up because of her beauty. And Minerva, a teenage poet with an abusive, often absent husband and two children. Yeah, Minerva is one of my favorites. I know. So there's also Mamacita. She's the big mama of the man across the street, third floor front. And this man brought her here. Um, She arrives with a baby boy in a taxi, and she is quite homesick. She doesn't ever leave the apartment. And Esperanza thinks it's because she doesn't know how to speak English. And she kind of talks about how her father came to this country as well, only knowing how to say ham and eggs for three months. And that's all that he ate, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, ham and eggs. That was the only word he knew. He doesn't eat ham and eggs anymore. So all the children kind of try to figure out why Mamacita might not leave her apartment. Some people think maybe it's because she's afraid to speak English. Some people say she doesn't know how to use the stairs. But either way, she sits all day by the window and plays the Spanish radio show and sings all the homesick songs about her country in a voice that sounds like a seagull. That's one of my favorite lines in the whole book. Mm -hmm. So sad. Yeah. When I read that line, I just hear a lot of different mariachi songs in my head. The gritos in the mariachi songs that are supposed Mm. to evoke this anguish and grief, but also kind of be like this amount of, it almost also sounds like laughter at times and supposed to be these two merging of like emotions. And so a lot of time in mariachi songs, there'll be like a lot of gritos in it 
takes the whole singer's body to sing it and it's mm -hmm. a very emotional experience and so when I read that line that's exactly what I picture wow I love that insight it, it reminds me also of when Esperanza says that her father listens to records on Sunday mornings when he is shaving songs like sobbing yeah mm, yeah yeah my dad loves listening to mariachi music and so that's like what I grew up listening to with him in the car all the time and yeah the, the grito can be like a it's like a really powerful emotion you know it can be like sadness but it can also be this I don't know awakening of power in a song so it doesn't always have to be really sad but most of the times I feel like in mariachi songs about heartbreak and longing that's what it is and you can it's one of those moments in a song where you could feel the singer's emotion just dripping out of it so yeah those those kind of songs you really have to be like sitting down paying attention to mm -hmm. so I like envisioning mamacita just you know staring out the window but like her eyes are like somewhere else she's thinking back to Mexico you know she's not at that window still anymore because those songs allow her to kind of go back there that's yeah. wonderful. So as Esperanza observes these women, she's also starting to mature herself. And this is emotionally and physically. One thing that is forcing her to grow up a bit quickly is the death of two family members, her father's father, and she sees her father in pain, and an aunt. And she's also starting to become aware of how men perceive her and how her body is changing. One of the first instances we see of this is when she, Nanny, Lucy, and Rachel spend a day walking through the neighborhood in pairs of secondhand high heels. And they're starting to attract the attention of the men and boys. And initially they're really enjoying themselves. And I kind of got the sense, not even necessarily making the connection of how they're being viewed. There's a point where a boy on a bike calls out, ladies, lead me to heaven. And they say, but there's nobody around but us. And they're asking people if they like the shoes. So the girls are initially enjoying themselves, but the outing ends when a local bum, uh, as Esperanza calls him, offers Lucy a dollar for a kiss. And that's the first, one of the first sort of inklings of real discomfort around perception and sexuality that I see in the novel. And another vignette a little bit after that, the girls discuss how their bodies are changing, how they're starting to get hips. And not long after that, Esperanza is assaulted at her new job when an older man forcibly kisses her. At school, Esperanza befriends a beautiful girl named Sally, who's often the subject of rumors. Sally's father, a deeply religious man, blames Sally for the way men look at her and regularly beats her. Esperanza continues to contemplate the nature of sexuality and gender roles, and at one point decides, quote, not to grow up tame like the others who lay their necks on the threshold waiting for the ball and chain, end quote. I love that. Mm -hmm. Instead, mm -hmm. she dreams of escaping Mango Street to live in a house of her own with bo her books and writing. Esperanza's friendship with Sally sours when Sally leaves her alone at a carnival, and Esperanza is ultimately raped. Sally later marries as a young teen and spends her day sitting inside the house, afraid to go outside without her husband's permission. At the end of the novel, Esperanza meets the three sisters, Lucy and Rachel's aunts, at a wake. They read her poem and predict that she will someday leave Mango Street, but remind Esperanza that her experiences here have shaped who she is. They tell her that she must remember to come back for the ones who cannot leave as easily as you. In the final vignette, Esperanza reflects on writing about her experience on Mango Street. While she still intends to leave, she resolves to come back for the ones I left behind, for the ones who cannot get out. Whew. Man. Don't... I'm just thinking about when we did The Giver, and I really wish that Lois Lowry would, like, <laughs> read this and... Just think about different ways that you can show and not tell. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> this book does that so spectacularly. I mean, to go back to the quote of not to grow up tame like the others who lay their necks on the threshold waiting for the ball and chain. Wow. Yeah. The part of the book where she says that is the vignette called Beautiful and Cruel. Mm -hmm. And she says, in the movies, there's always one with red, red lips who is beautiful and cruel. She is the one who drives the men crazy and laughs them all away. Her power is her own. She will not give it away. I have begun my own quiet war. Simple, sure. I am one who leaves the table like a man, without putting back the chair or picking up the plate. 
these seem like some of Esperanza's steps into a world that she is not the one she grew up in and not the one she's observed. I agree. The book does a lot of really interesting commentary and challenging of gender roles, which there's, there's a lot more to say on that. But before we get into that, I wanted to talk a little bit about the inspiration behind the book, why and how Cisneros wrote it. And so in an interview with NPR, she says, quote, I was fresh out of graduate school. I had started Esperanza in Iowa at the University of Iowa because she went, she was a student at the Iowa Writers Workshop, which is a very prestigious MFA program for creative writing. And she said, I was feeling very displaced and uncomfortable as a person of color, as a woman, as a person from a working class background. And in reaction to being there, I started to have some Mango Street, almost as a way of claiming this is who I am. It became my flag. And I realized now that I was creating something new. I was cross-pollinating fiction and poetry and writing something that was the child of both. I was crossing borders and didn't know it. I didn't realize that this was a piece that was begun at a creative writing MFA program, but that makes a lot of sense to me because of how experimental it is in terms of like, mm -hmm. it is prose, but it reads a lot like poetry. And absolutely, it's almost like flash fiction, like the vignettes are like flash fiction or prose poetry or some sort of hybrid. And I could see how this was a way of her as she explains, writing something that felt true to herself and true to her experiences, while also being palatable to probably like her snobby MFA peers, <laughs> you know, who wanted it to be very artful. And this is a book mm -hmm. that like somehow does both. And I think that's part of why it's a book that, you know, I mean, technically, I guess it's for young readers, but I really think that adults enjoy it just as much if not more what section of the library did you find this in because mine was in the adult section so i was lost for a little bit oh really well i didn't uh -huh. get it from the library but that's that's interesting i never read it at the library i actually started reading this book because my best friend steven had it on his desk in spanish class my sophomore year of high school and I was bored, and I already know this information. I'm just gonna read during class. And I picked it up, and I stole it, and I was like, I'm not giving this back. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just an incredible book. I couldn't put it down. And it was also really a powerful experience for me because it was his older sister's copy. And so she had written these notes in the margins. And so I was like reading another Mexican American woman's like thoughts on this book while I was reading it for the first time. And so mm -hmm. I just felt like this other connection to it. I like took it home with me and then I gave it back to him a few days later. And I was like, I'm going to the bookstore and I'm buying this. I love what you said. I think Cisneros would really like that. I hope so because I love her. So. <laughs> I also love that she can just can't stop being a good writer. Like, I mean, just even in these quotes, I was cross-pollinating fiction and poetry. I was crossing borders and I didn't know it. She's so I mean, smart. I know. And uh, she also talks a little bit more about her challenges in the Iowa Writers Workshop, which is kind of famously a, a difficult space for people of color or really anyone from any kind of marginalized background. She says, um, it wasn't as if I didn't know who I was. I knew I was a Mexican woman, but I didn't think it had anything to do with why I felt so much imbalance in my life, whereas it had everything to do with it, my race, my gender, and my class. And it didn't make sense until that moment sitting in that seminar. That's when I decided I would write about something that my classmates couldn't write about. And she also says, when I wrote House, when I started it, I didn't think that I was giving voice to Latino women. I thought I was just finally speaking up. I had been silenced, made to feel like what I had to say wasn't important. She says, I wanted to write something in a voice that was unique to who I was. And I wanted something that was accessible to the person who works at Dunkin' Donuts or drives a bus. Someone who comes home with their feet hurting like my father. Someone who's busy and has too many children like my mother. I wanted this to be lyrical enough that it would pass muster with my finicky classmates, but also open to accept all of the people I loved in the neighborhood I came from. Something that I really like that she talks about in her intro in the book is that she says, 
It's true. She wants the writers she admires to respect her work, but she also wants people who don't usually read books to enjoy these stories, too. She doesn't want to write a book that a reader won't understand and would feel ashamed for not understanding. She thinks stories are about beauty, beauty that is there to be admired by anyone, like a herd of clouds grazing overhead. She thinks people who are busy working for a living deserve beautiful little stories because they don't have much time and are often tired. She has in mind a book that can be opened at any page and will still make sense to the reader who doesn't know what came before or comes after. I love that. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of this Audre Lorde quote where she says, of all the art forms, poetry is the most economical. It is the one which is the most secret, which requires the least physical labor, the least material, and the one which can be done between shifts, in the hospital pantry, on the subway, and on scraps of surplus paper. As we reclaim our literature, poetry has been the major voice of poor, working class, and colored women. And so, and, and this novel isn't exactly poetry, but it's not exactly not poetry either. Mm -hmm. And I think the conciseness of it you know it really can be read in one sitting and the ways in which you can just read a few of the vignettes and I think get something really wonderful from it even if you don't have time to read the whole book she also has said that the idea of writing a bestseller was quote not on my mind when I wrote the house on mango street I wrote it to stop the swelling in my heart from stories that I was hearing and witnessing and you can really there is an urgency in the book and a pain in the book that yeah. really comes through. Builds it, throughout it. Was there anything else from the introduction you wanted to mention, Sonia? Yeah. At one point in the introduction, she has a line that says, her father calls every week to say, Miha, when are you coming home? And that was something that really resonated with me because that's something that my dad will often ask me. In the introduction, she also kind of talks about how women aren't supposed to leave the home until they're married. And so when... And, this introduction when she's talking about how her dad is kind of giving her a hard time for wanting to live on her own and pursue being a writer and not a weather girl on TV. It really just took me back to my dad's expectations. And since he immigrated to this country, he wanted me to be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm terrible at math and science, so we ruled that one out real fast. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was just a quote. For me, when I first read this book, I could barely get through the introduction because so much of it really resonated with me and so even just from the introduction I felt this deep connection with her before I even got to Esperanza and I was just kind of like I, un I understand that that questioning and kind of having to fight for what you want to do in your own life and breaking the rules that you weren't ever a fan of or didn't want established in your own life there's also another line um, in the introduction and she says her mother nudges her daughter and says, good lucky you studied. And it just brought a small smile to my face. Because so I was like, that's not, quote, perfect English. And it's in this book. And that's so exciting to me because that's how we speak at my house, too. And, like, you can put this in a book? <laughs> it made me really happy to see it. And so I... That was like another another way I got really excited about this book. I was like, okay, this is, it felt very much like home and it was like for me. And I was like, there's going to be a lot that I can resonate with this book and a lot that I think other people can too. And so it was another way that I felt it was pretty warm and welcoming to anyone to read, kind of like what she said earlier. So that's great. So we're going to be moving into our next segment. Let's talk gender. A subtitle, You Can't Spell Menace Without Men. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes aside, this book deals with some pretty heavy issues related to gender and sexuality. Pretty much any time Esperanza ventures out and experiences something new in the world, she is subjected in some way to overt or covert violence uh, by men, or at least the male gaze. So it, it happens a little bit subtly, like halfway through the book, she goes to the, to the baptism party and she dances with her uncle and then um, she has a really good time. She's having fun, but she notices that her older cousin, who she describes kind of as like a man boy, I guess he's a teenager, is watching her. She says, all I hear is the clapping when the music stops. 
My uncle and me bow, and he walks me back in my thick shoes to my mother, who is proud to be my mother. All night the boy who is a man watches me dance. He watched me dance. And it's it's a very foreboding, kind of ominous ending to what is otherwise a pretty happy chapter. And we don't see this boy, man boy again, but... But it's like we see different iterations of him. Yeah, this kind of leering male figure. Elsewhere, also, like Terry mentioned, I think, in the plot summary, when she gets a job, a older man kind of befriends her at the job, and she's grateful because she feels out of place among all these adults and someone's being nice to her. And then he grabs her face with both hands and kisses her hard on the mouth and doesn't let go, which is a horrifying end to that vignette. A lot of the vignettes end with, like, this stark example of of male violence that's pretty frightening yeah the book is dedicated a las mujeres to the women which i really enjoyed too and the endings you're right sarah all kind of end in like a gut punch and then there's like no there's not a lot that she does to make you feel better about it Mm. yeah at no point does she go to an like a relative and confide you know and, and be like this happened to me and they process it or work through it. Um, And I think part of that is because this stuff, it's kind of normalized. You know, it happens so much. Yeah, I think one of the stories, I think it's with Sally maybe when they steal Sally's keys and they won't give it back to her and the two boys are like, you have to kiss me to get the keys back. And Esperanza is like the only one that seems horrified and she feels like she's crazy because she doesn't like that that's the situation and she runs up to sally's mom and sally's mom's like what do you want me to do call the cops and it was like a really lonely moment i feel for esperanza where she kind of learned that it doesn't matter in that story if she told a parent or not the Mm -hmm. parent didn't feel like there was anything that they could do or that there was anything to do and so it was a very like isolating moment for her Yeah, that was, to me, one of the saddest vignettes in the whole book, because you see Esperanza realize that she's growing up and that she doesn't seem to want to, and that Sally seems to be enjoying becoming a teenager a bit more, and Esperanza feels kind of repulsed by it. She gets a brick. She says, three big sticks. Uh, And then she says, but when I got there, Sally said, go home. The boys all said, leave us alone. I felt stupid with my brick. They all looked at me as if I was the one that was crazy and made me feel ashamed. And it it kind of comes out a little bit, too, I think, in the hips vignette when they're talking about their hips and they're doing those like jump rope songs. And it reminded me of a song that my dad taught me when I was younger because he learned it when he was younger. And I'm not going to sing it. (laughs) Terrible singer. (laughs) But essentially, it's a song about how this young girl is noticing that all the pretty girls get into places for free. They don't have to pay any money. And then the song continues and she says, but that's okay. I don't want to be pretty anyways because all the pretty girls disappear. And so I have a recording of my dad singing it to me. And it's something that I was thinking about as I reread the vignette Hips, like how young we get taught these little songs. And it's a song that you would sing while you're playing a like jump rope. But it's like something that we learn pretty early on, but don't maybe necessarily digest it until we get a little bit older. Um, and so that kind of made me think of that vignette a little bit too. Wow. That's fascinating and very dark. And very fitting. Yeah, I mean, it, that, and that gets back to, like, the high heel incident, too. There's basically nothing comes without a cost, you know? Yeah. At first, they're excited. They feel older and pretty. And, and they're kind of liking the attention because I don't think they realize that it's sexual in nature. They just think mm-hmm. that they're kind of being admired. And I think we can all remember the first time that somebody said something to us that made us realize that we were always being watched yeah and that you're you're being perceived as a woman or as a future woman and not as a child and that that means that your life has become more dangerous Mm -hmm. at the end of the heels incident she says they're running fast 
They run away, and then she says, We are tired of being beautiful. Lucy hides the lemon shoes and the red shoes and the shoes that used to be white but are now pale blue under a powerful bushel basket on the back porch until one Tuesday her mother, who is very clean, throws them away. But no one complains. And Cisneros has commented on this incident in the book. She says, I remember when I was a young girl how much we wanted those high heels, but we didn't realize all the baggage it brought with it, all the attention, all the men on the corner sending kisses to us and saying things. It was very disturbing when you actually grew up and said, wow, I wish I could go back to being a kid. I was invisible and I could see everything but not be seen. But nonetheless, like, I mean, you think it starts when you're a kid. She is a kid. Yeah. She's 12. She's going to be a kid for years and years, but it starts so young. Yeah. And is so heavy. I mean, her friend Sally gets married before she's in eighth grade. Mm -hmm. So we see that childhood is very, very, very short. Minerva is only a little bit older than her and has few children. And then even Marin, who has no children of her own and is a teen with a boyfriend in Puerto Rico who, by all appearances, is young and unburdened, is still spending all of her time having to babysit her younger cousins and not leave the house. Yeah. I found this interesting academic article written by, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, Liliana Burkar from the Journal of Gender Studies in 2019. And it was talking specifically about high heels and this incident in the house on Mango Street. It's called High Heels as a Disciplinary Practice of Femininity in Sandra Cisneros' The House on Mango Street. And she contextualizes this incident by talking about high heels and says that the promotion of high heels has a direct stake in reconfiguring women and their bodies as symbolically and literally tiny and unstable, as fragile and helpless, and as sexually objectified and commodified. And so these high heels in this story are basically like an initiation into adulthood. And she says, quote, the girls discover that high heeled shoes do more than just change the look and feel of their legs, which is a frightening experience in its own right. As one of the girls observes, quote, it is scary to look down at your foot that is no longer yours and see attached a long, long leg, end quote. The girls discover that donning such magic high heels also results in another transformation, strutting or teetottering. This way of walking requires not only caution, but also a different kind of bodily comportment. Once the girls learn to readjust their bodily posture, they strut around their neighborhood in high heels, drawing the attention of boys and men alike. Esperanza says, Lucy, Rachel, me, teetottering, like so, down to the corner where the men can't take their eyes off us. We must be Christmas. But the girls find this attention short of being appreciable or desirable, because wearing high heels results in their sexual objectification, which reaches its pinnacle with a solicitation from an intoxicated man. Yeah, I think one of the things about that scene that makes it so scary is then when it's time for them to flee the scene, they're running away in high heels. Yeah, exactly. Which are very hard to run in. I mean, because it's, it's a small scene, you know, it's one vignette among many, but I think it's one of the most memorable. I think we can see Esperanza's desire to leave Mango Street as not just a desire to escape poverty, but also as a desire perhaps primarily to escape strict gender roles. This is a place where women are constrained by men in various ways. Many of them still are able to make beautiful things in their lives, have families and write, and you know, one woman goes to university. I don't want to su suggest that they're all like trapped in the attic of their husband's homes, but they are really constrained in a way that Esperanza does not want to be. And uh, the second to last vignette in the book is called A House of My Own. And she says, not a flat, not an apartment in back, not a man's house, not a daddy's, a house all my own, with my porch and my pillow, my pretty purple petunias, my books and my stories, my two shoes waiting beside the bed, nobody to shake a stick at, nobody's garbage to pick up after. Only a house quiet as snow, a space for myself to go, clean as paper before the poem. And so that's also an important thing to note is I think that we're supposed to kind of see Esperanza's desire to be a writer and her desire to break free of these gender roles as linked in some way. 
Yeah, and even mm-hmm. like outside of the, the physicality of it all, besides her wanting to leave Mango Street in this house and all of the other women in the book who she kind of sees as trapped. In the story, Sally, there's a quote that I love. She says, and you could laugh, Sally. You could go to sleep and wake up and never have to think who likes and who doesn't like you. You could close your eyes and you wouldn't have to worry what people said because you never belonged here anyway. And nobody could make you sad and nobody would think you're strange because you like to dream and dream. All you wanted, Sally, was to love and to love and to love and to love. And no one could call that crazy. And so we kind of also see that she not only wants to have her own space, but she kind of wants the space in her mind back too. If that makes sense. Mm. She really doesn't want to have to think about what other people want for her or their opinions about her like she wants her mental space back too and so we see her like wanting autonomy in so many different ways and so i really love that quote about sally wow me too it's it's interesting to think about the ways in which there are, are like traps and constraints that are physical like the houses in the neighborhood but also mental sandra cisneros has not been married, and I found a quote of her talking about it that I really liked. She said, I've never seen a marriage that that is as happy as my living alone. My writing is my child, and I don't want anything to come between us. (laughs) It reminded me of that, I think it was Whoopi Goldberg, who... (laughs) (laughs) I saw a headline that was like, Whoopi Goldberg on marriage, and then it was a quote, I don't want somebody in my house. (laughs) (laughs) I love that so much. (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, right? That's it exactly. Cisneros talked about how she moved. One of the reasons... So she lived for a long time in San Antonio before she moved to Mexico. And one of the reasons she moved from Illinois to San Antonio was because she needed space from her family for her writing. Because she said, like, basically she couldn't get any work done around them. You know, in her life, too, um, the house becomes a space for creativity, that's necessary for her. One of the things that I really, really loved about this book is that it has all these instances of the male gaze, you know, of being perceived and watched and leered at. But in Esperanza's writing, there's so much of the female gaze and how she views the women and girls in her life and it gives them, I, I don't want to say like a voice, but even just attention. But to be seen in a way that I think is loving versus being, or at the very least respectful, versus being seen in a way that is objectifying. Yeah, that's a wonderful point. While I was reading it, I was thinking about how for Esperanza, writing is like a form of empathy. And Mm -hmm. she, interestingly, like with the excerpt, Sonia, that you read about Sally, this is a girl who is kind of ostracized in some ways by the neighborhood and her father you know is extremely cruel to her and Esperanza looks at her with such generosity and such empathy and writing as an act of imagination and as an exercise in empathy and Esperanza at certain points kind of blurs into like an omniscient narrator where she knows things about these people's lives that Mm -hmm. we're not exactly sure how she knows it or if it's even possible for her to know that. Like we see it with the vignette where she talks about the young man who was killed in a hit and run and we don't really know anything about his past, but she kind of imagines a past for him. And, And she does that with Sally too, where it's like she's kind of presuming some things, but the things that she presumes are an attempt to humanize. Like she says, and no one could yell at you if they saw you out in the dark leaning against a car, leaning against somebody without someone thinking you are bad, without saying it is wrong, without the whole world waiting for you to make a mistake. When all you wanted, all you wanted, Sally, was to love and to love and to love, and no one could call that crazy. And so she kind of is like inferring these things about these characters and and drawing insights about them that are really like wise beyond her years. Mm Mm-hmm. Another part of this that I really enjoyed that she touches on is that the trope of coming to America and everything has like your life is so much greater isn't really in this book. And that's what I really enjoyed about it, too. She like really I mean, you see it with like Mama Sita and how Mm -hmm. like she asked her son, like, when are we going home? And he goes, what are you talking about? This is home. Like we live here. But the the character who dies in the hit and run who has no last name 
And she says, like, and his home is in another country. The ones he left behind are far away. We'll wonder, shrug, remember. He went north. We never heard from him again. We just, Mm -hmm. I, that, I mean, that story killed me because I thought of when my dad ran across the border here at 17 and there weren't cell phones back then. And his mom just had to deal with not hearing from him for weeks and just had to pray that she would get a phone call from him at some point. So when I read that story, it makes me very emotional because I Mm -hmm. just think about that. Like some people would never hear back from their families. And so I really love that as heartbreaking as that story is, that it's in there. And even though he doesn't have a last name, like I'll, I'll always remember his story. I just really loved that. It's not all sunshine and rainbows when you come here. And while it can have benefits, people can still miss their home country and still kind of feel like how she does, where they feel torn between two places. And they may now even feel slightly displaced, where even if they were to go back home, it may not be the same. It may not feel the same. The people that Mm -hmm. were once there might not be there anymore. And so I really like how she kind of touches on that there's a lot of challenges with moving and and starting a new life and and i think that's why there's so much emphasis and maybe like background knowledge that she's not supposed to really have about characters because she gets to know these people so well because they're all just trying to find or like make a new home in this in this neighborhood that story just kills me every time i read it i always have to put down the book for a little bit Mm. Yeah, the anonymity of this man is what I think is so... No one knows his address, there's nothing in his pockets. And um, Marin, the girl from uh, the neighborhood where Esperanza lives, met Geraldo at a dance, and then he was killed in a hit and run, and so she goes... she Or he's hit, um, and I guess he's not dead yet, and so they take him to the hospital, and she says... You know, that Marin stayed there for hours and hours, which was probably not necessary. He was a stranger to her, but um, for some reason she felt compelled to stay. It says only Marin can't explain why it mattered. The hours and hours for somebody she didn't even know. The hospital emergency room. Nobody but an intern working all alone. And maybe if the surgeon would have come, maybe if he hadn't lost so much blood, if the surgeon had only come, they would know who to notify and where. And then she says, uh, she met him at a dance. Geraldo in his shiny shirt and green pants. Geraldo going to a dance. What does it matter? They never saw the kitchenettes. They never knew about the two-room flats and sleeping rooms he rented. The weekly money orders sent home. The currency exchange. How could they? And that's the part where I was talking about where the writing is like this exercise in, in deep empathy for Esperanza because she doesn't know that either presumably at least not for sure but she can imagine it and she can make that inference based on her experience and other people she knows who who are in similar uh, situations as Geraldo and how they live and yeah I mean the detail she says it twice about and maybe if the surgeon would have come if the surgeon had only come you know this idea that the, this is a community that's underserved in so many ways hit and runs and pedestrian accidents do disproportionately affect um, Latinos and immigrants and people of color. And then often they're taken to hospitals that are underfunded and understaffed. And and then no real effort is made to really identify this man. It's just everything about it is just heartbreaking. I think also not giving him a last name allows anyone to pick up the book and imagine someone they know in his place to kind of going back to what she was saying in the introduction where that was really important to her. Not giving him a last name, I think, allows readers to kind of put their own insight into it. Like, you don't have to be Latinx or a character in this story to kind of imagine what that might feel like. She kind of gives you a little window there. Yeah, it's such a devastating... That one and the scene where she's raped, I, like, had to take breaks while I was reading them. It's so upsetting. Um, maybe we can talk about one that's less upsetting which is her name. I love her name, the My Name. Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite vignettes in the whole book, possibly my favorite, is My Name. It's a little vignette about Esperanza's name. 
I also really love this section because when I was in the third grade, I went through a week where I changed my name every day. I was trying to find myself um, as a third grader does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I got in trouble because on like the top of my homework, it would just be a different name every day. And my teacher was like, who is doing this? <laughs> and I got pulled to the side because, you know, a process of elimination. <laughs> yeah, she right. was like, what are you doing? And I was like, what do you mean? She goes, your name is Sonia. And I go, no, not today. And she goes, no, it is. Like, your parents chose your name. And I go, right, they chose it. I don't know if it's for me. If it is, I'll come back to it. I'll let you know. <laughs> Very profound. Yeah, you know, I was not allowed after that. My mom got called in, and we had to have a discussion. <laughs> Sonia, would, would you read the my name section? Do you want me to read the, the whole thing, sir? Yeah. Okay. Do you mind? No, no problem. My name. In English, my name means hope. In Spanish, it means too many letters. It means sadness. It means waiting. It's like the number nine, a muddy color. It is the Mexican records my father plays on Sunday mornings when he is shaving. Songs like sobbing. It was my great-grandmother's name, and now it is mine. She was a horsewoman, too, born like me in the Chinese year of the horse, which is supposed to be bad luck if you're born female. But I think this is a Chinese lie, because the Chinese, like the Mexicans, don't like their women strong. My great-grandmother. I would have liked to have had known her, a wild horse of a woman, so wild she wouldn't marry. Until my great-grandfather threw a sack over her head and carried her off. Just like that, as if she were a fancy chandelier. That's the way he did it. And the story goes she never forgave him. She looked out the window her whole life the way so many women sit their sadness on an elbow. I wonder if she made the best with what she got, or was she sorry because she couldn't be all the things she wanted to be? Esperanza, I have inherited her name, but I don't want to inherit her place by the window. At school, they say my name funny, as if the syllables were made out of tin and hurt the roof of your mouth. But in Spanish, my name is made out of a softer something, like silver, not quite as thick as my sister's name. Magdalena, which is uglier than mine. Magdalena, who at least can come home and become Nenny. By him always, Esperanza. I would like to baptize myself under a new name, a name more like the real me, the one nobody sees. Esperanza as Lisandra or Maritza or Zizi the X. Yes, something like Zizi the X will do. I love that one too. I always so get, like, full body chills when she says uh, the way so many women sit their sadness on one elbow. Ugh. I know. And then and I, I've inherited her name, but I don't want to inherit her place by the window. So many windows in this book. Yeah. So much watching and looking out. Yeah, it's interesting, Harry, to think about this in relation to the Our Harriet the Spy episode, because it's a book that's, like very much about observing a community and a neighborhood um without being without a heinous little hag <laughs> yeah without being a huge bitch about it <laughs> um, <laughs> me writing a review for this <laughs> cisneros esperanza does a great job not being a huge bitch about it <laughs> but that's what i it's like what you were saying there's so much empathy given to these people i mean think about how harriet would describe these women you know, and then the way that Esperanza sees the circumstances of their lives and extends so much more compassion towards them. Yeah, the sometimes the voice in the house on Mango Street, very rarely, but sometimes like strains credulity for me in terms of I cannot believe a 12 year old would be this insightful, you know, but I think that she's able to make it work because there are still moments of childlike voice and a simplicity and kind of like a, a, a baldness in her observation yeah. um, in the way she talks about her little sister. Like, she still does sound like a kid. I think some of the excerpts that we're pulling are like the particularly insightful, mature things. But there's also... Oh, Can I do one of my favorites? Yeah, yeah. I love the one where the girls are... It's called And Some More. So they're talking about clouds specifically, and it's almost as if the four kids are sort of having a different conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they're talking about 
names and the different types of clouds like cumulus and then is it nenny who starts naming the clouds no it isn't no i think it's rachel but anyway she says like that's phyllis ted alfredo and julie and then it turns into an argument one of the girls says there's that wide puffy cloud that looks like your face when you wake up after falling asleep with all your clothes on ronaldo angelo albert armando mario not my face looks like your fat face Rita, Margie, Ernie. Who's fat face? Esperanza's fat face. That's who. Looks like Esperanza's ugly face when she comes to school in the morning. And it's all cut through with these different names. I'm amazed by how many names this girl knows and doesn't seem to repeat any of them. And it turns into this exchange of insults. Chicken lips, rosemary, dahlia, lily, cockroach jelly, jean, geranium, and joe, cold frijoles, Mimi, Michael, Mo, your mama's frijoles, your mama's ugly toes, your ugly mama's toes. That's stupid. Bibi, Blanca, Benny, who's stupid? Rachel, Lucy, Esperanza, and Nenny. It's this really great childish exchange. Yeah, that was funny. And also, at the very beginning of the book, when Esperanza is kind of describing her family, she says, Nenny is too young to be my friend. She's just my sister, and that was not my fault. You don't pick your sisters. You just get them, and sometimes they come out like Nenny. <laughs> and then she says, she can't play with those Vargas kids, or else she'll turn out just like them. And since she comes right after me, she is my responsibility. And so you can hear her kind of, like, mimicking, and, a, you know, clearly an adult has said, she can't play with them, or she'll turn out just like them. Like that's... Exactly. And so there is, like, that very childlike voice. And then it ends, though, with this really beautiful image she says someday i will have a best friend all my own one i can tell my secrets to one who will understand my jokes without me having to explain them until then i am a red balloon a balloon tied to an anchor she's so good okay so my favorite one of all time is four skinny trees they're the only ones who understand me i'm the only one who understands them four skinny trees with skinny necks and pointy elbows like mine Four who do not belong here, but are here. Four raggedy excuses planted by the city. From our room, we can hear them, but Nenny just sleeps and doesn't appreciate these things. Their strength is secret. They send ferocious roots beneath the ground. They grow up and they grow down and grab the earth between their hairy toes and bite the sky with violent teeth and never quit their anger. This is how they keep. Let one forget his reason for being, and they'd all droop like tulips in a glass, each with their arms around the other. Keep, 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 trees say when I sleep. They teach. When I'm too sad and too skinny to keep keeping, when I'm a tiny thing against so many bricks, then it is I look at trees, when there is nothing left to look at on the street. Four who grew despite concrete. Four who reach and do not forget to reach. Four whose only reason is to be and be. Wow. That's a great example of one that if I hadn't seen it on the page, I would probably think it was poetry. Yeah. I yeah. Agree. The repetition, the images, there's not, there's not a narrative really. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. a reflective, like lyric moment. Something that I noticed about her writing too is like the attention to sound and like the repeated... E sounds in those last few sentences that you read. It's really a piece that I think benefits from being read aloud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I really like the the attention to sound like you were saying because then it almost becomes like a mantra or something that you can kind of tell yourself when you're having a hard time. And so that's why I really love the petition and and the attention to sound. I think it makes it easier to remember something you can tell yourself even if you're not looking at it on the page. It's like an incantation almost. I always think of lines and parts like that as being something you can keep in your pocket and remember it afterwards. Yeah. And this book is full of those, you know, like I read this book for the first time many years ago, but I still, when I was reading it, I would read lines and be like, oh yeah, I've had that line memorized for 10 years, you know? Oh my God, they just stick with you. And I think you can really see her training as a poet. I mean, in that way, it's like a poetry collection, right? Yeah. You can just read one of the poems and get something from it. You don't have to read the whole book. You should, but you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like this is a, a, a excerpt where there's a lot of rhyme. It's called What Sally Said. He never hits me hard. 
She said her mama rubs lard on all the places where it hurts. Then at school she'd say she fell. That's where all the blue places come from. That's why her skin is always scarred. But who believes her? A girl that big, a girl who comes in with her pretty face all beaten and black, can't be falling off the stairs. He never hits me hard. But Sally doesn't tell about that time he hit her with his hands just like a dog, she said, like if I was an animal. He thinks I'm going to run away like his sisters who made the family ashamed. Just because I'm a daughter, and then she doesn't say. And it goes on, but I mean, the rhymes are like pretty obvious in the beginning. We get hard, lard, scarred, hard, and then later we get away, ashamed, say. And it's not so obvious, you know, it doesn't sound like sing-songy, but it for sure intentional. Yeah, I agree. I also really love the quote from Papa Who Wakes Up Tired in the Dark. Yeah. My Papa, his thick hands and thick shoes, who wakes up tired in the dark, who combs his hair with water, drinks his coffee, and is gone before we wake, today is sitting on my bed. And I think if my own Papa died, what would I do? I hold my Papa in my arms. I hold and hold and hold him. I love that we get at least one man who isn't awful i know like thank god her her father is kind he's like an oasis <laughs> yeah and we don't get much of him you know he's not the focus of the book at all but yeah that one vignette where she, you know he learns that his father has died and his father is in mexico and so esperanza is trying to be there for him in his grief but doesn't really know how to do it and and, and so she imagines what it might be like to lose her father and then doing that is very upsetting to her mm -hmm. I love and I love the description of my my father who gets up in the dark me too especially because my dad does as a garbage man he's up at like two fifteen in the morning so I, wow. I'm always every time I read this book I'm always so sad I never read it earlier not that like my life would have changed sounds so dramatic but I think I like really would have I don't know. I just think about what would have happened if I had read it when I was earlier, how much, how many more connections I would have made with it all. But every time I read that section, I go, my, my dad does too. He has like thick hands and he puts on his work boots and he gets up and drinks coffee and then he goes to work and it's still dark outside. It's interesting to me that that's the excerpt that we get about the father. It's like a very vulnerable moment because in the introduction, she kind of talks about her father and how they don't they didn't always see eye to eye because of the gender roles and there's a quote that she says on the weekends if i can sidestep guilt and avoid my father's demands to come home for sunday dinner i'm free to stay home and write i feel like a bad daughter ignoring my father but i feel worse when i don't write either way i never feel completely happy yeah it's interesting that she chooses not to make that kind of strife or strained relationship a focus in the novel. The book really is focused on the women. Speaking of women, one of my other favorite parts of the book is when she introduces us to Marin. So Marin is the teenager whose boyfriend is in Puerto Rico. And it says, and since Marin's skirts are shorter and since her eyes are pretty and since Marin is already older than us in many ways, the boys who do pass by say stupid things like, I'm in love with those two green apples you call eyes. Give them to me, why don't you? And Marin just looks at them without even blinking and is not afraid. Marin, under the streetlight, dancing by herself, is singing the same song somewhere. I know. Is waiting for a car to stop, a star to fall, someone to change her life. That's like so much of this book. It's just mm -hmm. like... <laughs> you just read it and you sigh. <laughs> yeah. Because you just have to sit with these lines. And then, like you said, you can take them with you afterwards. So many of these women are either trapped or waiting. And Esperanza is waiting. Marin is waiting. And that's really where the mm -hmm. novel gets any hope or joy from at all. Is the possibility that something is going to change. And the notion that it could be one of these women who changes mm -hmm. or when she talks to Alicia and she says, this isn't my house. I say, and shake my head as if shaking could undo the year I've lived here. I don't belong. I don't ever want to come from here. You have a home, Alicia. And one day you'll go there to a town you remember. But me, I never had a house, not even a photograph. 
Only when I dream of. No, Elise, he says. Like it or not, you are Mango Street, and one day you'll come back to. Not me. Not until somebody makes it better. Who's going to do it? The mayor? And the thought of the mayor coming to Mango Street makes me laugh out loud. Who's going to do it? Not the mayor. And then later, you know, she comes to the realization that it was with the three aunts where they tell, you know, they tell her, like, you'll have to come back. And she says, what I remember most is Mango Street, sad red house, the house I belong, but do not belong to. I put it down on paper and then the ghost does not ache so much. I write it down and Mango says goodbye sometimes. She does not hold me with both arms. She sets me free. One day I will pack my bags of books and paper. One day I will say goodbye to Mango. I am too strong for her to keep me here forever. One day I will go away. Friends and neighbors will say, what happened to that Esperanza? Where did she go with all those books and paper? Why did she march so far away? They will not know I have gone away to come back. For the ones I left behind. For the ones who cannot out. And I love that moment because it sounds so much like Sandra Cisneros' description of writing The House on Mango Street. She says, I wrote The House on Mango Street to stop the swelling in my heart from the stories that I was hearing and witnessing. And here, she, and in the book, she said, Esperanza says, I put it down on paper and then the ghost does not ache so much. There's like this compulsiveness to tell these stories. The writing is like a form of liberation and as a form of identity and... And also, I feel like a freeing Esperanza and probably Sandra Cisneros as well for, of some shame, you know, this idea that instead of hiding where you're from or lying about where you're from or saying that's not my house, you can claim it. And that yeah. gives you something powerful and something unique. Like she said, she wrote a story that none of her classmates could write. It's like putting something down after you've been carrying it for a long time. Right. So time for our next segment, and now a word from us kids, where we share some online reviews that have been posted by kids of the book that we're reading. So unfortunately, there were not very many reviews for The House on Mango Street on Dogo Books, which is the website that we usually use. So it has an average rating of four out of five stars on Dogo, which is, I'm sorry, but that's just incorrect. This is a five out of five, yeah. five star book, so... Like, didn't the giver have, like, four and a half or something? Yeah, the giver that's was... fucking criminal. Yeah, the giver was higher rated. <laughs> <laughs> that really grinds my gears. <laughs> the good news is that the reviews were mostly positive. A lot... Some, some kids commented on, like, having trouble accessing the text or feeling confused by its lack of plot, which I can understand. It is kind of experimental and unconventional, uh, especially if you're a child. But I, Kyra underscore Marie loved the book. She said, this is a wonderful book that contains a bunch of short stories. Each chapter is in a different point of view from different characters, and I read it in about two days in Spanish. Um, I do want to provide a slight correction just for clarity's sake. Each chapter is about different characters, but they're not written from different points of views. Yeah. Esperanza is always the narrator. But anyway, she says, it carries a very good and helpful message, too. The story starts off where the main character dreams of having her perfect dream house for her family to live in so they don't have to keep moving to different places every few weeks and months. She wants a real home. The story then goes on to tell the stories that formed the girl's childhood and how she matures. There is a bad incident that happens to her. Maybe a little boring for some people. Sandra Cisneros is a great writer, and I love all her books and stories and short stories and our literature books, exclamation point. Oh, great review. Yeah. Definitely underplays the bad incident. That would not be the one word that I use to describe it, but... Gets brushed over a bit. But I do love that this girl has read multiple books by Sandra Cisneros. And unfortunately, I, so I read some reviews on Amazon and Dogo and Goodreads, and most people liked it. And then there was a loud minority that was like, this book was boring, which I find so irritating. I know. Uh, anyway. It's not boring. <laughs> no. You know, it's, I mean, it's beautiful. And like you said, I think it can be a little bit harder maybe for kids to connect to the vignettes, but I mean, it's, it's a very accessible book, I feel. Like you said, I mean, you could read this in a sitting. Yeah. 
I think, too, also, like, the fact that the vignettes are so short makes it really accessible because it's like even if you don't like one of them or you're bored it's over exactly in like 30 seconds (laughs) yeah yeah I really wish I would have read this when I was younger because I wanted to write a novel when I was young and I I did it's terrible but I thought that was like the only way you could write was to write a novel yeah like I hadn't even really stepped into poetry I had no idea what the heck like cnf was Mm -hmm. I was like creative nonfiction. what's that I don't know and so if I had read this, I think it would have like really opened my eyes. Oh my God, you can write like in any form that you want. You can tell mm-hmm. these little stories and that counts as a book. What? Like, so to me, I'm like, yeah, what the heck do you think is boring? Like, show me, yeah. show me a book you think is good. I want to fight you. <laughs> if it's the giver, I swear to God, I'll lose it. <laughs> <laughs> Meet me outside. <laughs> So I also found this interesting academic article written by... Maria Carafilis, called Crossing the Borders of Genre, Revisions of the Buildings Roman in Sandra Cisneros' The House on Mango Street and Jamaica Kincaid's Annie John. And it was published in 1998 in the Journal of Midwest Modern Language Association. The reason why I wanted to bring it up is because it comments on the really interesting ways in which Sandra Cisneros twists the coming-of-age Buildings Roman genre. So the article defines uh, Buildings Roman as a novel that relates to the development of a male protagonist who matures through a process of acculturation and ultimately attains harmony with his surrounding society. And the author of this article notes that, quote, by appropriating and modifying this traditional genre, Cisneros comments on dominant Euro-American society by revising or even rejecting some of its values and certain aspects of its literary traditions. Thus, in a sense, Cisneros colonizes this literary form and reverses traditional lines of power by controlling representation instead of passively being represented by the dominant culture. The article later goes on to say, three of the primary revisions Cisneros makes are her emphasis on the communal instead of the individual, her emphasis on fragmented and circular narrative patterns instead of linear movement, and her critique of American materialism and manipulation of the stereotypical American dream to include those usually excluded, the poor and or non-white. I think that's really interesting because, I mean, the first time you read this book, it might be a little confusing because there are so many characters and not all of them are super important or play. Like, it's not like in a traditional novel where if you're introduced to someone, you're like, this person's coming back later and they're going to do something. What we get really is like a portrait of a community rather than like a story of one girl's experience, which I think is really beautiful. And I also like how this mentions the the manipulation of the stereotypical American dream, because it gets back to what you were saying earlier, Sonia, about how it doesn't, it's not a story about how coming to America saves these people's lives or makes them their lives even better. Their lives are difficult in different ways. There's not really, I mean, I don't think you could call anything about this the American dream, except for maybe the dream that Esperanza has at the end of the novel of writing, Mm -hmm. having a house of her own and writing in it. Anyway, um, Terry, you want to read the next quote? Sure. The author also says, instead of striking out by herself, leaving the provinces for the city as protagonists in traditional buildings Roman do, Esperanza learns of herself and her culture in great part through her connection with other people. In many ways, the Chicano community in her Chicago barrio serves as an extended family and Esperanza learns about herself and her complex position as a working class Chicana in the urban United States through the stories of her neighbors. I love that word choice too, the stories Mm -hmm. of the neighbors. Takes me back to a quote that was in the intro. In the introduction, she's just kind of talking about how can art make a difference in the world? And one of the things that she says is, and what about those who have such learning problems they can't even manage a book by Dr. Seuss but can weave a spoken story so wondrous she wants to take notes. And so I just, I love the idea of, you don't have to be a writer to be a storyteller. Um, Mm -hmm. You don't have to have gone to school and had this like education. So I really like that. Yeah. Now we're getting close to the end. So we'd like to talk about some of the lessons that we think this book has for us. Some of the things that we have to learn from it. Yeah. Absolutely. Observe and cherish the women in your life, please. (laughs) Look at them with love and compassion and empathy. 
and consider their circumstances. I agree. I also really like the idea of writing as liberatory, writing as freedom, writing as a way to imagine a future for yourself that the other people around you might not be able to imagine. Also, stay away from racist little girls named Kathy. For sure. <laughs> They're only going to be here till Tuesday. And honestly, <laughs> you have better things to do with your time. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I think the importance of this book, I think what Cisneros learned from writing the book is the importance of claiming your past in the places that you're from and recognizing that there's power in that and write about it. So let's rate this book. We will rate it out of 10 shared bicycles. So this is easy for me. I would give this book 10 out of 10 shared bicycles. No questions asked. I'm in agreement. I would also give this book 10 out of 10 shared bicycles. Absolutely. Take my money. 10 out of 10 shared bicycles. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. So thank you all for listening to our 10th episode of Reading During Recess. Woo! -hoo. Listeners, we love you. We do. Thank you. We do love you. Please keep subscribing and writing reviews. And you can find us on Twitter or Instagram at reading underscore recess. We love to hear from you guys. So please, please get in touch. And also our Gmail account is reading during recess pod at gmail.com. And Sonia, where can our listeners find you? They can find me at my website at www.sonialara.com. And to all you dreamers out there, stay reading.